You're live. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Bice. I am the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a steering committee member of the NDP Socialist Caucus, past secretary of the Toronto and York Region Labour Council, and a retired member of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. We acknowledge that this gathering takes place on the Indigenous lands, including the unceded territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Wendat and Audenoshani people. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource company corporations and returning them to the commons. Tonight's webcast is titled Boom or Bust, the Future of Global Capitalis Capitalism, with socialist action political economist Yazin Kaya, Rosemary Nadiuk in Winnipeg, and Corey David in Toronto, and I will be hosting the show. Yasin will give a talk for about 25 minutes, followed by Rosemary, who will speak for about five, and then Corey, who will speak for five also. Then we'll take a few questions from the online audience. Audience members can submit a question by accessing the webcast directly from YouTube or by typing the question directly onto the chat. Um, Please direct your questions to a specific person if you so wish, or you can direct it to all. If you like this webcast, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. If you agree with what you hear during this program, please join Socialist Action by signing up at our website, www.socialistaction.ca, and by calling 647-986-1917. That's 647 986 1917, easy to remember. 1917 was the year of the Russian Revolution. So let's begin. Yasin studied political economy at, as a PhD student at York University, and he is the member of Socialist Action in Toronto. He is a co manager of the SA website. As, but as I said before, when introducing Yasin, most importantly, he is the father of two smart and beautiful girls, Rosa and Isla. So welcome, Yasin. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And for the record, Elizabeth is the godmother of one of my children, and she's spoiling her. Uh, I really like these webinars. It is very friendly. I'm in my bedroom right now, and uh, I feel like you know we're having a kind of a very casual discussion. And so uh, although the topic of the uh, discussion is, is really serious, I hope that we can have a kind of, you know, humorous uh, exchange between all of us and, and the audience here. And um, and I, I want to start with a personal problem of mine. I, I purchased a beard trimmer and uh, it stopped working. Uh, it happened again, I decided to return it. But here's, here's the issue. I've been around since 1980s, but capitalism uh, was hit by a crisis in 1990, 1990s. I was back in Turkey. Another crisis in 2000s. Then I came to Canada, 2009 crisis. And then again, there's another crisis. Can we return this capitalism? I, I mean, we can, if we can return the beer trimmer, I think we should do uh, better with, with, a, uh, with a system that keeps, keeps getting broken. Anyway, so uh, today, here's the plan. I mean, in, in the remaining 23 uh, uh, minutes, I will start with uh, making a kind of an argument. I will say, nowadays, we're experiencing a crisis, but this is not only a crisis in capitalism, it is a crisis of capitalism. It is a crisis of the capitalist system. So this will be one of the uh, premises of the talk today. And secondly, I will try to elaborate on the Marxist interpretation of the crisis. So there are many explanations of the crisis, economic crisis. The most common ones are neoclassical or Keynesian explanation of the crisis. And all the uh, universities are full of people uh, who support such explanations. But Marxist theory is uh, marginalized. Uh, we don't hear much from the Marxists or trying to explain the crisis. Uh, since this is a venue that social, uh, socialist action enabled and socialist action uh, happens to be a Marxist organization, you know, we will give some more space uh, to, to Marxist ideas. So I will try to elaborate those, those explanations a little. And then we will have a more 
a, a kind of a closer look to the 2008 crisis. It was a big crisis, and you know, and we're now experiencing living through the second uh, big crisis, global crisis of the uh, uh, 21st century. So I think it's. Uh, I think we should we should better understand the 2008 uh, crisis so that we can understand the crisis that we're in now. And lastly, I will try to finish the, with a comparison of the crisis that we're in now with the uh, crisis in 1930s. But good things happened after the 1930s uh, crisis, especially in North America. Um, working class gained some victories, including uh, you know, uh, job secu uh, social security, some uh, unemployment payments, so on and so forth. Uh, so then we, there's reason to be optimistic. Maybe after this crisis, which is comparable in size uh, and scope to the 1930s crisis, maybe good things will follow too. But there's a critical difference between the crisis back then and now. Back then, the organized labor was very strong. So the uh, final argument that I will make will be, in order to uh, bounce back from this crisis and to uh, you know, uh, redistribute the wealth, Towards, uh, the, towards the working classes, in favor of the working classes, there's a key element ingredient missing now. That's the strong um, organized labor. And I think we should all try to uh, build that. All right, let's start with the first one. Uh, I said we're uh, in crisis of capitalist system. So um, as uh, the readers of Socialist Action blog would know, um, capitalist crisis started before the COVID-19 hit. Of course, after the COVID-19, which triggered the uh, extreme measures to contain the or address the pandemic, and uh, economy economies, especially in the advanced capitalist world, stopped, and um, so the uh, economic output declined very sharply. But uh, you know, even like in December 2019, uh, there were signs. We were exp uh, observing signs of a big, big crisis co coming. In fact. In our sister organization, Social Action United States, their website, um, we, we wrote the, the, the title was uh, the title of a 2019 article was Is the World Economy Soon Headed for Recession? I repeat, is the world economy soon headed for recession? And in March, the world economy was in recession. So, um, and in Germany, for example, let me uh, take a look at the stats here. Here, in 2019, I wrote this in the Socialist Action blog, Germany had its lowest great growth rate since 2009. It, uh, and in Japan, I don't think we wrote this in, in the Socialist Action blog, but still, maybe we will write it next time. Um, in 2020, in the second quarter, um, uh, yes, J Japanese economy was also in crisis too. So uh, its uh, national output was uh, falling dramatically, and um, the uh, the uh, and 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 the, the the crisis, global crisis, came after that. So what I'm trying to say in so many words is this: although the global recession started in March, we were seeing uh, a huge downturn in the world economy right prior to the crisis. So what's happening with with uh, with my um, uh, beard trim trimmer or or the capitalism? Why why do they keep uh, getting bro bro breaking down? Um, in fact, um, capitalism. Here's the thing: in capitalism, when we study the capitalist uh, economy, we see that every four to seven years we have business cycles. So the economy goes up and down, up and down. It's almost like a roller coaster. You know, in your lifetimes, probably you experienced many business cycles, and uh, the, you know some of us experienced more than others, and uh, because you know uh, we have a very diverse audience. Um, so, um, but sometimes those downturns, business cycles, become crises. Okay, right? Business cri uh, those crises are a bit more uh, rare, but more rare is the crisis in the capitalist system. So economic downturn in such crises coincide with peak in other social problems. And when you read the newspapers or watch the TV or go into the internet, we see that's exactly what's going on. In addition to an economic downturn, we see a social crisis in the United States, for example, African-American people are on the street and there are many uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, contentious issues there. 
internationally speaking, the hegemony of the U.S. is contested. Uh, the international relations, inter, you know, international arena became very, very anarchic, and um, there are many wars, or um, you know, literally wars, conventional type of wars going on, or uh, uh, there are very, you know, so many conflicts, and the U.S. hegemony is unable to contain those. So, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, the economic crisis, we're seeing social crises and, and international crises, and that makes us to say, I conclude, this is one of those crises, crisis of the system, very similar to, to the one that happened in the 1930s. So it, not, in, in all, uh, uh, not all, only in terms of the magnitude and the scope, but also in terms of its quality or characteristics, today's crisis resembles the uh, Great Depression of 1930s. And uh, and uh, as you know, uh, you know, many millions are unemployed uh, in the U.S. alone. There are 40 million unemployed people on the streets, uh, or in, in the United States, 40 million, and uh, the remaining uh, uh, 120 million workers are experiencing or will soon experience the pressures of unemployment. Uh, probably. Uh, you know the uh, when there is more unemployed uh, the bosses what uh, they they push the wages down they say you know we can easily replace you mr worker and so they threaten to push the uh, reduce the wages and uh, so in addition to the skyrocketing uh, unemployment rates we see a threat a risk of plummeting of the real wages in in united states and elsewhere to in japan in many industrialized countries and uh, and uh, uh, as, as I, I was trying to say, in the 1930s, the, there was uh, another uh, uh, crisis of the system. But uh, back then, uh, the, uh, the wealth was redistributed towards the working classes. So, um, and some uh, social security, unemployment uh, uh, benefits uh, were made uh, um, uh, available in the United States back then. But as I said, uh, the organized labor, uh, the industry, especially in the uh, industrial, uh, heavy industries, in the uh, automobile sector, in the key industries of the uh, economy, uh, organized labor was very strong. Plus, the state was willing to uh, absorb the unemployment that, uh, that the private sector uh, caused. So um, the, the state became one of the top employers after the 1930, 1930 crisis. It was the, the state, the public sector, be became the engine of economic growth and recovery. And uh, those social problems could be absorbed by containing unemployment uh, with increased public em uh, employment. So today, we don't see these two trends. We don't see the trend of working class organizations becoming stronger. And we don't see the state taking a huge role in key industries and uh, creating uh, investment uh, projects, large scale investment projects to contain the unemployment uh, that the private sector caused. So what's happening? Why do we have repeated crises uh, in, in capitalism? As I said, let's, let's take a look at the uh, uh, Marxist interpretation of the crisis. Um, you know, there's, if, you're, if, you, if you like, uh, controversies, reading polemics, uh, read m Marxists and especially the Marxist economists. Um, you know, they especially in terms of the uh, in, uh, interpretation of the economic crisis. There are several uh, schools of thought, and each school of thought, uh, you know, argue that uh, Marx, Karl Marx, uh, uh, favored one of the explanations over the others. Um, in my opinion, I think there is uh, a lot to learn from every different interpretation. Perhaps we can try to, you know, uh, come, come up with an uh, explanation that brings uh, uh, most of these theories together. So let's start with this so-called under-consumption theory. How do they explain the, uh, uh, the crisis? Uh, for example, in the, uh, the, the crisis in the, the, the downturn in the 1980s, they say, with the 19, uh, the, I'm now talking about the under-consumptionist, under theories. 
they say in the 19, 1980s, uh, um, as a response to declining profitability, uh, the, the wages started to uh, stagnate. So the increase in the real wages uh, stopped. And this caused uh, a reduction in the household income, obviously, due to the declining wages. And hence, people, households, increased their debt. So as a response to, as a result of the uh, stagnation of wages, we see an increase in household debt. And when you're in debt as a household, us, uh, when your real wages are not increasing, what do you do? Well, you spend less. As the typical response, uh, but uh, in, in the working class families, uh, but when the uh, households stop spending, when the demand declines, and uh, as a result of the purchasing power, then um, the, the, there is uh, uh, too much capacity, productive capacity in the system. Right. So the, the capitalists, the bosses, have all the machineries to build fridges or cars. They have money to invest in uh, buying more offices or um, building new plants, but nobody is buying your product. Hence, then uh, the uh, the economy, according to the underconsumption theories, eventually hits uh, by a crisis. And um, in the absence of getting enough profits from the productive sector, according to them, uh, speculation on finance sector. Uh, uh, what became a venue for for the uh, uh, business class to make profit. So less wages, more debt, less purchasing power, less demand, excess too much productive capacity, and turn towards financialization. This is how uh, the underconsumptionist theories explain the, uh, 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 especially the recent crisis, and they that's the, how they explain the 2008 crisis as well. And probably today's crisis can be explained with that, those terms too. And um, secondly, uh, there's another big, uh, you know, school of interpretation, a group of theories who uh, who to say, okay, we don't need to look at the consumption; we should look at the production. And they talk about a tendency of rate of profit to pulp. They argue uh, Karl Marx formulated this tendency in his masterpiece in, in uh, Capital. So uh, I just learned a cool, cool trick, uh, which is sharing my screen. Uh, and I will try to share my screen with you right now. OK, there you go. So this is from one of my favorite uh, writers, uh, Michael Roberts. He writes in the uh, next recession .wordpress .com. Uh, You know, take a look at his blog. Uh, he calculates um, the rate of profit in the US. So look at this, like there's almost like a secular decline from the 1940s onwards. Uh, so in the, there's, a, there's a kind of you know, increase in the 50s. Uh, some uh, slow, you know, uh, reasonable uh, increase in the 1990s, but then, you know, uh, it tends to go down. So uh, what this shows is in the U.S. alone, uh, you know, it's, it's, there are ups and downs, but, usually, uh, but in general, a kind of, you know, a downward trend uh, since the um, golden age of capitalism uh, or in 1950s. So enough of graphs. Uh, if you're interested, go to his blog. But I wanted to uh, show that to you uh, uh, because um, uh, now I, you, you can see me, right? I stopped sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to show that to you to show uh, you know, the tendency of rate of profit to decline is an empirical phenomenon. It is something that happens in the real world, not only in the theory pages. And uh, let's try to explain why. You know, how, what's the mechanism uh, of 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 this theory? Uh, well, why does why, why does why is there a tendency to for the economic rate of profit to decline? Uh, this may sound a bit too theoretical at this point. Bear with me just for two minutes. So, the rising organic organic composition of capital declines. What do I mean with this? That means I'll be as slow as possible, 
the value of means of production, that's the factories, offices, the means of production, their value, will rise, okay, relatively to the value of labor power. It's our capacity, working classes' capacity to, to produce. I repeat, the value of means of production will rise relative to the value of labor power. Um, but according to, the, to Marx, the profit is only produced by labor power. So the value produced by labor power will decline relative to the cost of the uh, cost of uh, investing in means of production. And so eventually the rate of profit will, will tend to fall. So then the, but the thing is like, if there's a tendency to, for the profit to fall, will it, will it continue to keep on falling? Uh, is there a limit to that? Well, Karl Marx says there are also counter tendencies, which are uh, sometimes fictitious profits from finance capital increase, so financialization, um, or rise, rising rate of uh, uh, surplus value. How can you do that uh, with increasing exploitation? You can either, uh, not that you, but if you're a boss, you can make your workers work harder, longer hours for the same wage, and this can you know, counteract the uh, uh, declining rate of profit. Or, you know, means of uh, production can get cheaper. You can pay less for the same technology. Um, and, uh, and you can uh, push the wages down uh, to the extent that they're, they're less than the uh, uh, value of labor power. So, you know, many people nowadays uh, get a wage that is not enough for them to survive. Uh, so that's, that's creating a kind of, that acts like a counter, counter, a counter tendency to rate of profit to decline. Okay, so um, under consumption theory, rate of profit to decline. So what exactly did happen in 2008? I think we have, uh, we can get elements from these two theories. For example, uh, the uh, tendency, uh, yes, uh, the, the tendency uh, uh, of rate of profit to decline uh, uh, was there. And as a counter tendency, we see a, a, a push uh, to downward wages. In the 1980s, the, uh, the power balance in the economy changed. Uh, the bosses, started winning the war against the workers, especially to, against their organized organizations, and that enabled them to push the wages down. And that enabled, that enabled, uh, the uh, that caused the workers' purchasing power to decline, okay? So as a result of the class war, the capitalists won, and the, re uh, the result was the purchasing power being diminished. And uh, when you don't have enough uh, coming from uh, through your paycheck, you usually borrow, right? So that caused uh, a huge increases in credit. And that caused financialization. Fi and the working classes so sorry, the, the bosses, the capitalist, uh, uh, capitalist uh, bosses saw opportunity in two trends. One, you know, the workers need more debt. So uh, uh, they, they were included in the financialization processes. So, um, you know, workers' pensions were being invested in stock markets. So uh, everybody became uh, a part of the financial world. Um, and secondly, and the uh, bosses said, you know, why should we you know, make risky decisions such as invested, investing in, you know, productive industries? You know, I would just take the money and go to the stock market and make profits uh, uh, quicker. So finance that also became a kind of a, a gasoline to uh, uh, feed the uh, fire of financialization. And but uh, that bubble burst uh, bursted. You know, it's a, it was a bubble. Uh, and uh, you know, after a financial panic, uh, the, all those instabilities in the, in the system just exploded. You know, you, you remember, most of us would remember what happened in 2008 crisis after the 2009 uh, downturn. Um, the first thing that the uh, states did was, you know, they bought the toxic 
toxic assets, the uh, the financial instruments that were worth nothing, and the uh, governments purchased those. You purchased those, you know, because the government got that money through taxes, and they purchased those uh, toxic assets. And uh, of course, they the governments decided to print more and more money quantitative e easily, and which meant there was uh, a lot of uh, money in the system which were channeled to the private banks, which, you know, gave the credits to the, uh, to, the, to, the, to the private sector. But here's the thing, you know, money is being printed with the hope that the money will, you know, generate the uh, mechanism of the uh, productive uh, industries. But the uh, bosses take this money and say, you know, why should we invest? Uh, we should just, you know, go to the stock market and make, make, make a lots of money. And the same happened in the in the developing world, so-called developing world. All this cheap credit, you know, money was very cheap. Borrowing, the cost of borrowing was super cheap, right? So um, the 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 investors in the first world were looking for opportunities to invest in the developing world. And in the developing world, they saw all this money coming, hot cash, and they uh, they just uh, you know use that money to. Uh, uh, further financialization processes in their countries. Uh, but uh, again, the, the root of the problem, which is not enough investment or the profits coming from the investment was still there. And uh, still we're, we're seeing a kind of a dual economy. So on the one hand, our economies are hit by the crisis, but in, on the TV, in the TV, in television stations, in the, in the mainstream media, you know, we, we, we almost, they, 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 you know, they, they act as if the crisis doesn't exist. Why? Because stock markets are, you know, uh, skyrocketing. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, money is flowing to the stock market, uh, not to the investment, uh, invest, uh, invest, uh, you know, productive industries. So as a result, we almost have a dual economy, you know. The financial sector is booming, whereas the real economy is collapsing, and the working classes are almost like dying in the ruins of the uh, uh uh, economy, uh, the real economy. Okay, so let me let me wrap up my uh, 25 minutes, but uh, you know, repeating what I uh, said. First of all, what we're seeing is not only a crisis in uh, capitalism, but also uh, uh, a crisis in the capitalist system, uh, coupled with the economic crisis downturn, coupled with the uh, social crisis, and international crisis. And uh, secondly, uh, although the crisis today resembles the uh, Great Depression in 1930s, the key element today is missing, that's the uh, a pow of powerful organized labor. And I think uh, those who, you know, um, uh, see the, uh, uh, you know, inherent, uh, uh, inherent problems in capitalism and its crisis-driven nature, uh, you know, and, and we see that the working classes are, being hit by all these economic crises, uh, the, we, we, should, we should find a remedy to that. And it seems like the only remedy uh, goes through uh, building stronger working class organizations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Yasin. Just a reminder to comrades too, to please unmute before, before you speak. Okay, so next we will hear from Rosemary. She is a lawyer, a past NDP provincial candidate, a member of the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg and a leading member of Socialist Action. Welcome, Rosemary. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So uh, just ripping off of the topic of the, of the webinar, uh, boom or bust, uh, perhaps another way of putting it is socialism or barbarism, which is something that um, Trotsky talked, talked about in the the Marxists and, and socialists and fourth internationalists talk about. Uh, I've been reading Trotsky's uh, musings in the transitional programs, a book that was put out in the, I don't know, the 70s by uh, Socialist Workers Party. And it records uh, discussions that were had in 1938 between Trotsky and members of the Socialist Workers Party, as well as the transitional program itself, which uh, my understanding is Trotsky never had a chance to really finish before he was murdered. Um, very fascinating reading. It could be, if you change a few names, 
uh, of the people and organizations that he could have been talking about what's going on today. Um, his um, description focuses a lot on uh, his analysis of what the what the problem is is that is that there's a huge failure of leadership. I and mean, Yasin just referenced the the difference between then and now. Uh, is that uh, there were working class organizations, but and, and now it's they're even weaker. And also the difference now is that added to the crisis, what's different today is that the element of climate change and all the mobilizations in that regard, and it's not just the working class that are mobilizing around that, as well as more, more currently the COVID crisis, which has thrown a whole different... Um, set of values into play. Um, Trotsky, no, reading th in this book, he, there's a passage where he talks about the success of fascism, he focuses on Italy, where there was, he, fascism was in the minority and uh, the, uh, the progressive forces were actually in government, but fascism triumphed because it was organized and it was organized and it was armed. And it was violent. They were just afraid to use the, their the, 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 the power that we had, and uh, succeeded. Fascism triumphed in Italy and other places for similar reasons. Uh, I just like to read, uh, um, in terms of the the, the failure of the of, a, of the uh, organizations of the working class of the masses of the progressive forces. There's a very lovely passage that. Uh, which are in the in the book that I'd like to to read. It's just a paragraph. Um, under the this is what we're talking about the, in the thirties and late thirties. Under the influence, under the influence, and the the, the, the subheading is uh, against sectarianism. In the right spot here, no, sorry, wrong spot. Um, the tragic defeats suffered by the world proletariat over over a long period a uh, long period of years doomed the official organizations to yet greater conservatism and simultaneously sent disillusioned petty bourgeois revisionists in pursuit of new new ways, in quotation marks. As always during epochs of uh, reaction and decay, quacks and charlatans appear on all sides, desirous of revi revising the whole course of revolutionary thought, sound familiar. Instead of learning from the past, they reject it. Some discover the uh, inconsistency of Marxism, others denounce the downfall of Bolshevism. There are those who put responsibility for the revolutionary doctrine for the mistakes and crimes of those who betrayed it. Others who curse the medicine uh, be because it does not guarantee an instantaneous and miraculous cure. The more daring promise to discover a panacea and in anticipation recommend the halting of the class struggle. A good many prophets of new morals are preparing to regenerate the labor movement with the help of homeopathy. The majority of these apostles have succeeded in becoming themselves moral invalids before arriving on the field of battle. Uh, thus, under the guise of new ways, old recipes long since buried in the archives, archives of pre-Marxian socialism are offered to the proletariat. So, uh, there's an expression in French, plus ça change, plus ça laisse pareil. Um, so, Marx, uh, Trotsky also references Marx, uh, Marx's comment that no, in boomer bust, where are we going? Barbarism or, social, or, social, or socialism or barbarism? Trotsky quotes Marx or paraphrases Marx, no one's society leaves its place until uh, it totally exhausts its possibilities. So uh, then he goes over the uh, 229, there we go. talks about the um, the um, talks about the. Of course, there was there was there were the there was the war, the first world wars. Many and uh, um, the um, the last war was a result of the fact that the world market became too narrow for the development of the productive forces, and each nation tried to repulse all the others and to seize the world market for its own purposes. 
They could not succeed, and now we see that capitalist society enters into a new stage, and yes, it must have went into the mechanisms in which that takes place. Many say it was a result of the war, but the war was a result of the fact that the society exhausted its possibilities. The war was only expression of its inability to further expand. After the war, the historic crisis became deeper and deeper. Capitalist development everywhere was, uh, everywhere was prosperity and crisis, but the summation of the crises and prosperity have been an ascendancy. I don't quite understand what that means. And beginning with the war, we see the cycles of crisis and prosperity forming a declining line. It signifies now that the society has exhausted totally its inner possibilities and must be replaced by a new society, or the old society will go into barbarism just as the civilization of Greece and Rome because they had exhausted their possibilities and no class could replace them. Well, it looks like Trotsky was wrong on that. 30 seconds. Uh, we, we, we rebounded. And um, uh, Trots uh, Trotsky goes to... Three, three prerequisites for a new society to take place. One is that the productive forces must be sufficiently developed. The second, that the, there must be a new progressive class, which is sufficiently numerous and economically influential to be able to impose its will upon society. And the th third condition is a subjective fat factor. The class must understand its, understand its position of society and have its own organizations. And that is the condition that's now lacking. I would say that that is still lacking. Uh, and uh, particularly in the United States, uh, well, not just in the United States, because we had such things, such phenomena as Syriza and Podemos in, in, uh, in Europe, and that uh, came to nothing. So I, I think we hear, we, we don't hear about a lot of things that are happening in the States. Uh, if revolution doesn't, if a significant shakeup uh, and, and progressive forces organizing doesn't happen in the United States, um, we may be in for a very rough, rough ride, indeed. maybe not wars, but uh, other forms of fascist uh, social uh, phenomena. And uh, I don't think capitalism has exhausted itself. I think that it will try to to, in, to, to put in a basic income. Uh, and uh, maybe we can talk about that uh, later in the discussion. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. Okay, next is Corey, a young machinist in Scarborough, a guitarist and a poet and an executive member of Toronto Socialist Action. Welcome, Corey. Uh, thanks. And, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Rosemary, because I'm actually going to gonna go on to talk about basic income a little bit. Um, because I hear a lot about it today, I'm sure, as, as you all do, as everyone does. Um, and, and everyone's pushing it, the Liberals, the NDP, the Green Party in Canada. And a lot of people are talking about it around, around the world, too, including in the United States. So, but, but I mean, if you look at these parties now, these capitalist parties that are pushing it, and, and other, other uh, talking heads on, in media and stuff that are talking a lot about it. I don't think they're, they're talking, talking about who's going to pay for it and what it's going to mean and how it's going to affect um, the economy. And, and, and I mean, also like the real economy that Yasin mentioned, like the actual uh, productive force of people, not just the financial system um, and, and its profit. Because if, if you don't make sure that money comes from the most wealthy people, then you're just making sure that money goes back to the most wealthy people. Because if you're giving people that have the, like the, the bare minimum in society to survive, and you're giving them money to spend, and of course they're going to spend it. And they're going to spend it on cheap stuff, right? Which typically are monopoly corporations or, or the closest thing to monopoly corporations. Um, and so that money is just going to get funneled back into Walmart and Amazon, anyone who can provide cheap things for people to continue to, to scrape by. I mean, UBI will obviously, as, as any individual, will use their means differently and whatnot. So this is just sort of a general statement. But but that's what's going to happen. There was a study in Mexico. Um, I can't remember it was older. It was older now. But they 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 did a, a test with UBI, and they did one community was given a, 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 a like a sum of money. One community was given nothing, and one community was given uh, like food, like I believe like a, like a ration of rice or something like that. And what they found was um, that UBI actually inflated prices, right? So the the power the money that they gave those people actually became less valuable, whereas the place where they provided um, the food ration that the, 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 the companies around there, the, the small businesses and whatnot actually to lower their prices to compete now because people no longer had to go out and, and buy and buy the staples that they needed. Right. So they, they, they needed to compete with the, with the cheap market and therefore sell more. Right. And so there was actually a need for more production. And I mean, and that's, that's sort of the, the crux, I think what, what Yasin was talking about. Well, I don't know what's the crux, but, but talking about actually producing things for human need and, and the crisis of consumption or the, or the, or the lack of consumption. Um, and so my position on UBI is to only support it if it's 100% funded through some kind of wealth tax, 
And I think, uh, I think that's, that's um, a fair position to have on it. I understand that the people need, need um, uh, help out there. There's a lot of people living in poverty. I mean, the system just basically manages poverty. It doesn't try to eliminate it or, or, you know, yeah, eliminate it, get rid of poverty. It just sort of manages the crisis of poverty. Meanwhile, I'm putting no restrictions on, on, on the, the most wealthiest people in our society or very little, you know, and, and giving them all kinds of opportunities to continue to grow their wealth and to hide their wealth from the governments and the governments may then make deals with them. I mean, this is the capitalist system and, and it's screwing you and it's screwing me. But like we talk about, and and like we've talked about today about the um, but the New Deal, sort of about what happened after the '30s and the restart of the economy. I mean, you could say a, part, a lot of that I think came from the war and the need for war production, and so the, the the country leveraging its ability to 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 push productive force right to to into those um, industrial jobs to produce military equipment and whatnot, and to also bring tons of people into the military and other public services at the time. Um, but we don't have a, a war right now. And I mean, like, like we discussed, labor is very weak. I mean, there may be a war in the near future, but so I'm getting off topic here a little bit. So the new deal, um, it, it increased the quality of li- like the standard of living for, for the vast majority of people throughout, you know, North America and sort of that sort of like leftist like reformist uh, governments that t- took, that were in power in various places around like the Western sort of, homogeny around us homogeny in britain and europe and whatnot they were able to actually sort of stave off the crisis of capitalism by 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 putting that money into people's pockets right but they only helped out a a section of people in society i think that's something that's important to think about i mean as as trotsky's were internationalists but but we have tons of migrant workers throughout the world that are that are exploited terribly and i, and I don't think they got any help through covid-19 that i understand and i see them at tim hortons you know they're desperate for for to to work i'm sure because they need to pay the bills um and they have landlords that are threatening landlord corporations now that and and that's sort of another point i wanted to get into that has to do with financialization but also with with the housing markets and 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 since they can no longer profit off um I, excesses or i guess just things that are not you know the bare needs um capitalists are are now profiting off of human needs i mean they have been for a long time but now it's happening right here at home i guess more so than i would say it has happened in the past um with with housing crises in any major city really and just and that's causing a ripple effect in in other communities for the, the housing to go up there i mean you look at like it's it's not dropping even even with the with the COVID happening, how's the housing market is still rising. I mean, I think there's a fair amount of market manipulation there, um, but just the yeah, and capitalists holding on to assets that they don't need to sell. It's like all this dead money sitting in 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 tax havens, you know, and it's not doing anything, and it could be doing a lot, but but they they know that the system relies on leveraging people's desperation to. Um, to push society forward, right. To continue, continue production. I mean, another crisis is, is, is happening. I think, I think within the education system, I'll just talk about this a little bit where, where their, their companies no longer, they don't train people as much as they used to, right. You come into a company back in the day and, and they would develop you. Right. But now they want you to have everything when you get in there. Right. So someone who has the advantages and can go to university or can get some kind of um, internship or whatever has way more advantages over, over someone who doesn't have those connections or, or, or whatnot. And so I think that's something to think about too, is, is the working class is being further propagandized by the media that's owned by corporations to not challenge things, right? And they're also being denied an education and an ability to further themselves, right? As they have to look for desperate jobs where they have to work tons of overtime and they don't have opportunities to think and they're exhausted at the end of the day. It's, um, I think it's, it's all part of the same system and, and it's, it's going to lead to, it's, it's, it is in a crisis and it's going to lead to a further crisis until, until it's confronted. And that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Okay, so thank you all, in fact. So now what we're going to do with the help of our technical producer, uh, Kurt Young, we're going to air some questions from our online audience. And to our panelists, uh, you will be given uh, up to five minutes each to answer one or all three questions. That's up to you. And the lineup will be as follows. Rosemary will be first, Corey will be second, and Yasmin will be third. And as I said, you can answer one, two, or three questions within your five minutes. So, Kurt, I'll turn it over to you for the first uh, two or three questions. 
Uh, sorry. Uh, so we have three questions to start off. So our first question comes from Barry Wiseletter, and he asks, uh, to avoid boom and bust cycles, why is it not possible to plan the market economy to stabilize it, to make it more productive, more ecological, and more egalitarian? Chad Brazer asks, uh, in the 1930s, unions were encouraged at the federal leadership level. Should we expect this to be an important ingredient in reinvigorating a new labor movement, if not one based on the old industrial model? And he added in the U.S. after a point anyway uh, to clarify what he meant by which federal government supported unions. And then uh, Philippe Stewart as would be good to recommend some introductory reading material for newcomers to this topic. I remember uh, Roe helpful Ernest Mandel's pamphlet into the Marxist econ economic theory uh, to my generation. So there you have it. Okay, they have the three questions. So uh, Rosemary, you have five minutes. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Just a minute. Can you? Okay, you can see me too. Yes, can you see can. me? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it is possible, Barry, to um, make the capitalist to the market to uh, plan the market economy to stabilize it and make more productive and ecological and more, more egalitarian but I, I don't think that the, that, the, that that's this that's the ethos of capitalist, capitalism that's not what the the capitalists will allow uh, unless they they're they're pushed really to the wall and I really think um, in uh, I don't agree with Corey in terms of his critique of uh, basic or I'm, not, I'm actually not sure where he's going whether he's opposed to it or not he's sort of saying he's not necessarily opposed to it but I think that they will they will give concessions if they see their power th threatened by financing basic income by whatever means they can even by coughing up some of their uh, Cayman Islands funds to uh, to finance it because that will keep them in power or keep, keep them in control of what's going on and they with the, with the hope that eventually then they'll be able to recoup what they what they what they forked out to to make sure that the economy and the, that there's no revolution. The economy keeps going, there's no revolution. So I think it's possible, but it, 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 it'll, it'll just in terms of uh, resuscitating enough to keep, to keep stumbling along. So it, I, I don't think it's going to, doing such a thing with the market economy, economy is gonna create a, a socialism uh, as a discussion that was had long, that was had long ago with, with Rosa Luxemburg, etc., and uh, in the uh, before the between the wars. Anyway, um, and in terms of the second question, uh, unions. I, I'll leave that that to somebody else that's more familiar with unions. I'm, I'm the, the union leadership is extremely corrupt and extremely comprador, and is quite interested in preserving its 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 own uh, um, privileges. I think that there's. I will leave that to other people who are more, more involved in unions. What what hope there is of the unions being uh, leaders in uh, bringing about socialism? And I'm, I'm skeptical. And which then, uh, and then that, that, that's a topic for another webinar. I think. Well, how do we how do we get from here to socialism? And I totally agree with uh, with you, Philippe. That um, it'd be nice to recommend some reading before the before the women are. And I'm sure that uh, people like Barry or uh, Yassine would have some, some ideas about uh, some good introductory materials. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Rosemary. Corey? Yeah, so about a, a planned economy. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna, I've been reading uh, Mao's China and After, so it's been quite interesting. It talks a lot about the economic planning that went on within China and how their system worked. But it's just sort of making me think about about this. And I mean, you you can have you could possibly definitely have a, an economy that works for for people. But 
it, it, it also depends on the material situation a lot. It's not just about just planning something and making it happen. You know, in Canada, obviously we were in a capitalist system like much of the world is. And so you, we have to confront that. And there's a huge talking about labor and government. There's a huge fear, I think, among labor leadership and maybe even members, you know, like I said, propagandized by the media as well about how, how fickle the situation is and how, how labor is so precarious. But, but there's a big, a big fear, I think, within, within the movement, at least among leadership people who I think are afraid of losing their, their privileged position or rocking the boat too much or of destroying what, what, what exists already for them, as, as many union jobs are reasonably good jobs compared, compared to non-union in the private sector. Um, so, so to do with the planned economy, you can, but, but you need to build the foundation I would think of, of to, to support the planning, right? To make sure that it happens. So you need to understand, you need to have a very good economist and very good people, uh, managers and organizers and, and have the the workers willing to do it, right? To make it happen. So so it's possible, but it's it's a lot of work and we're not there yet, but um, but I think we will get there. And, and so to the second question, alliance between uh, labor and the capitalist party, uh, capitalist parties, or I guess you could potentially have a socialist party within a capitalist system, potentially, but they, they wouldn't be revolutionary, I guess. But, but I mean, the NDP allies with labor a lot, but they don't, they don't talk about it as much, you know, because there's, there's also kind of a perception of labor, I think, that, that isn't very negative. You know, a lot of people think that, that they don't, you know, do, they don't have real jobs or whatever. They're not really working, and they're so privileged, and they're, which is totally false. You know, I know tons of people that really come out from labor and, and, and give their all, and, and at work they give their all. But, but there is some like apathy at work or what's the word? I don't know. Um, uh, absenteeism, I guess it gets brought up a lot, I think. And that's, that's created by the, the capitalist system. People are disinterested, you know, because they don't have the proper supports because all these public systems and all these, all these um, are underfunded. They don't, they don't have, this is what I'm talking about public unions, I guess they don't have, you know, great, great job and they don't have great leadership at their job either as more, more institutions move to more of a business model and away from actual social, um, social upheaval or, or just, yeah, and, and improving the country in general or improving a, a, anything in general. Um, so I don't, I think an alliance between labor and capitalist parties is actually not a good idea moving forward. If you're, if you're looking to actually make, make a socialist economy, but I guess in the meantime, like I, like I said earlier to someone, you know, you got to use the tools you have. And if, if, even if they're the master's tools, right. If, if they're the, the setting up the legal parameters for what is allowed and whatnot, and they give you, the, the certain rights and certain abilities, then we have to use those um, to um, to uh, to our advantage, you know, to build a socialist economy, to avoid a capitalist crisis. But we can't rely on alliance between labor and capitalism. But we can we can definitely um, use it. Hopefully, the NDP will move, you know, more towards a workers' agenda and away from what they're doing. Anyway, so thinking about that too, and, and the planned economy, just thinking about the great leap forward and the, and the cultural revolution in China, as opposed to the other periods in that time, which were extremely bureaucratization and stabilized the country, right? So they had a very centralized plan economy that controlled things, but they really de-radicalized people, right? So people didn't, you know, weren't participating in the revolution anymore. Um, and so I think that's something to really think about. If we have a centralized economy, we have to really think about how to engage people, make sure that they're part of the process in that economy to avoid uh, another uh, another type of crisis, you know, uh, a crisis of, of power and bureaucratization. And so I would really recommend um, Mao's China and After. I'm not even done reading it yet. It's a really dense book. It's by Meisner. Um, and, but it's, it talks a lot about, about uh, 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 you know, the economy of, of China versus, you know, and it's, it's, it's geared towards capitalism and what it, ha what, it, what, it, what it failed with and what it accomplished under sort of more radical uh, economic ideas. Anyways, that's, that's all I would say. Thanks. Thanks, Corey. Yasin? Yeah. Thank you, Corey, the guitar player, poet, and machinist. What a, what a nice title. Uh, you're so cool. Uh, I really like this discussion. This is really good. Um, the, one of the questions was uh, asking for, yeah, recommendations, uh, introduct, yeah, recommendations for um, newcomers to the, to the topic. Yes, as the uh, question says, Mandel is great. Introduction to Marxist economic theory is great. Um, like in my opinion, I, th 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 here's how I learn. I, I usually learn better when um, uh, I see a practical application of the theory to the to the to the ongoing uh, situation. So if you're a newcomer to the theory uh, to the topic, I would start with socialistaction.ca. Uh, we we wrote many articles on on uh, on the economy and what our writers do is you know they read the theory and try to find the applications to the uh, to the current uh, uh, world events so uh, you 
you know, you, you, you learn the theory in action. And our sister organization in the United States, uh, they, uh, their website is socialsaction.org. They have pamphlets and, um, um, you know, Socialism 101 um, uh, resources on their website. And I strongly recommend their, one of their leaders, uh, Jeff Mackler, M-A-C-K-L-E-R. He wrote pamphlets on the Marxist economics. So I, I, I recommend you uh, visiting uh, uh, socialstruction.org and reading Jeff's um, uh, articles and the pamphlets too. About the unions, uh, great question. Um, so first of all, you know, when we say unions, we do not necessarily mean the uh, unions that we see in um, in TV shows such as Sopranos or Godfather or The Wire. You know, we're not talking about unions that are, uh, you know, have to have close ties with the mafia because that dominates the uh, mainstream, uh, the commonsensical uh, the imagination. Uh, obviously, our audience is more um, um, uh, informed than that. Uh, but we do not even, you know, uh, limit our imagination to, uh, to uh, you know, unions, traditional unions that are organized in, you know, key industries, uh, very hierarchical organized, or and that, that are trying to, you know, uh, defend the interest of their 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 members only. We're talking about more like we're imagining more like a social union, social movement unionism. Uh, we're talking about unions that do not only, uh, you know. Uh, 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 defend their members' interests, but also interests of the uh, wider working class organs, uh, working class. So you're talking about automobile, say, a union uh, that is organized in the auto industry, but uh, you, uh, at the same time defending the, uh, you know, food delivery workers' interests. And we're also talking about working class organizations becoming more and more active in the underrepresented sections of the working class, such as, you know, this gig economy or, you know, service sector, so on and so forth. And, um, and we have to add one more thing there. Uh, there, is, there is a big dis uh, mistrust. Uh, uh, people do not trust the uh, existing organizations of the working class, existing unions. And we should carefully, we, we, I think this is a very important thing that we should study. Why? Do workers and the youth uh, turn their faces away from the from unions? And in fact, the sometimes the uh, the uh, the consequences of this is, is is catastrophic. In the United States, for example, like the uh, working classes uh, hope uh, that Trump will come and defend their interests. So the the mistrust is leading into rise of the far right and uh, eccentric uh, leaders. So uh, that union question is very important, but when I'm trying to say, when I say, you know, we should defend the organized labor and what, uh, we, we need the unions uh, to, uh, you know, um, come up with a, with a better solution than a broken capitalism, I do not necessarily mean the unions, uh, the, the traditional unions, but also a working class or social movement unions that, you know, uh, tries to uh, uh, the, you know defend the interests of the entire society, the entire working class. So Barry's question about planned economy, I think I will use my second five minutes to try to answer that question. So I'm done for now. Okay, thank you, yes. And then before we go on to uh, further questions, I would just like to say, uh, yes, Yasin is right. We do have such pamphlets. And remember, we have all of these pamphlets and more on our S Socialist Action Literature Table at all of our events. Of course, because of COVID-19, our Lit Table events are a little limited, but you can always write to Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com or call 647-986-1917, and we can certainly uh, get together and make sure that you can uh, purchase any or all of these pamphlets that you might need. Okay, so I'm going back to Kurt. Kurt, more questions? Yes, uh, we have several more questions. Uh, we have room for. We have time for one more round for sure. With maybe a little more time, so maybe we can take four questions if possible. All right, I'll try and. Uh, we have four questions, so I'll uh, ask them all. So our first question comes from Stephen Crozier. He asks. 
how do we prevent UBP, universal basic poverty? So, uh, and then Daniel Terry asks, the UBI proposal reminds me of how allotment was used to steal land from indigenous people in the U.S. Rather than collectivize the indigenous land, they were first forced to divide their land into private lots. And this is this not similar to how collectivized healthcare and other social services will be abolished and replaced with UBI instead of to each what they need from each what they can? People are divided. Uh, we have another question from Chad Brazer who asks, do we need an NDP prime minister to get a modern national industrial recovery act? And uh, uh, Barry Wiseletter, another question from Barry Wiseletter who says, to raise the rate of exploitation, the bosses try to weaken workers self-defense, even eliminate a right to strike picket protest. Alberta's uh, bills one and 32 are examples. What was sh what should we do about this? Okay, so we're going to go back to our panel. We have four questions. So uh, let's see, our time is 801. So uh, if everybody keeps to their time, and please do that, I will give you up to eight minutes each. Uh, to answer. And we're going to start with Corey, then Rosemary, and then Yazin. Okay, great questions. Um, so I'll try to answer all of them, I guess, and then I might have some closing things. Uh, universal poverty, how to prevent it. I mean, the capitalist system, like I said, I think their their goal is to just manage poverty. And, um, and, and then that's pretty much it. Just let it kind of happen there. Maybe it'll increase or whatever. But as long as it's not resulting in a mob that's going to tear down the leaders. They'll just sort of let it happen or, or do the bare minimum to keep it going. So how do we prevent it? Um, there are, there are potentially radical ways to prevent it or there, or there are, are, are state ways to prevent it. Right. So if you have state sanctioned protections for people, right. Like housing is a human right. Like it's actually in the charter that it's a human right. And so they would, they could say something like, like I've been yelling at so many liberals on, that, are, that are talking about how great they are, that they really should get rid of for-profit housing. And that's, that's something that I think, I don't understand how that could be an unpopular campaign. You know, I, uh, there are a lot of people that rent, I guess there are people that rent out houses too, and people that value their private property, but there are a lot of people that rent. And if, if, if they didn't have to pay these absorbent amounts of rent and they could actually pay a reasonable sum that they knew was going to the state and therefore would be back invested into other infrastructure, I think they'd be much more willing and much more happy to, to pay that than to pay a, a private landlord that's just patting their, their pockets or their bank accounts, wherever they might be. Um, so you could do things like that. Um, you could try, I think more radical ways to do from the bottom up would be like, like community of seizures of lands. Like I know there's near me on Dawes road here, which is in East York, which is close to Scarborough where I live. There's an occupation going on from indigenous people there on unceded land um, because nothing um, East of East York was actually purchased in the Toronto purchase. So there's a lot of there. So they're, they're using that legal argument, right. To, to say that they had that this land is unseated and they're taking it up. Right. So they're taking that land and they're, they're housing people there and they're forming a community. Right. So a lot of it's been based around charity right now. And I guess that's kind of what I'm talking about is, is a type of charity, I guess, but I, I, I would like to see something more like what the black Panthers did where they actually organized clinics, they organized um, schools, um, they, they organize entire communities, right? And so that's kind of what's happening at this at this land back. Um, I can't remember Wasiaga. I can't remember the name of it, but um, but but they've taken this land, and they've so these people now have a safe place to go where they have food, where they have other people they can talk to, you know, that 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 are that are probably in the in the same situation as them in terms of at least it's 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 meant to be for indigenous people, and I think that's who they primarily support there. Um, because that's the whole justification for the occupation is that it's indigenous land and they're indigenous and they've been disenfranchised so much. So, so there is that aspect. I don't think they're growing food there, but they've started to build structures and, um, and we'll see where it goes from here. But I think that that's, a, that's a more radical way to, to, to address poverty is to actually just seize, <laughs> seize, you know, the means for survival, not the means of production, I guess, but to seize the means of survival. Right. And it's not, not a long-term solution. Um, but but I think if you like I said with the UBI example in Mexico, if if you can if you can take away from the capitalist system and and, and I mean they're going to see them as a threat and I'm sure that people are calling the police all the time to go and harass them and they are and they showed up with guns there at that at that uh, occupation, um, but but if you can if you can actually 
compete and show people that it doesn't have to be this way, then that can do a lot to change people's minds. So some of these acts, although they may not be victorious in a material sense, they can be, they can have moral, not moral, moral victories, I guess, to a certain extent, at least in my opinion. And they can, they can, they can spread consciousness and, and, and show that, you know, that really just because this piece of paper says this land belongs to this guy or this factory belongs to this guy, it doesn't really mean it, right? It's, it's not, it's not real. There are all kinds of people put their work and, and effort into building these things. And so that's what we really need to think about. We need to break this sort of uh, consciousness, I think, that's over people that, that, that they expect the, the state or these corporations to take care of them um, because that's what they're, they're told they should do. You know, the, the welfare state was created by capitalists to, to take care of people so that they, they, they could manage the crisis. Right. And so I think that if you're looking at, at some sort of radical way to do something like that, that would be uh, an immediate sense, but I don't think it's a, it's a long-term solution. It's definitely not a solution to, um, to getting out of this crisis on mass. Uh, we, we need socialism. We need to have, you know, workers control, democratic control of the economy. Like just think of the Canadian economy went equally to all Canadians. Like, what would that even look like? Like, I don't know, but I'm, I'm just thinking um, that, 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 that this, this cannot go on and that there are ways um, to confront it and to challenge it. And, um, and that's what we should be doing and supporting, uh, I think, going forward to, uh, to, to address the crisis in that sense. Um, the allotment of land that, that Daniel talked about um reminds me a lot about Palestine with this new deal they're promising, they're proposing sort of, and now the CBC is saying that the Palestine isn't a state, you know, so, so <laughs> this is sort of legitimizing this whole Israel thing, which is just, this has just sort of happened, right? Like Palestine, as far as I'm concerned was a state, it wasn't recognized by the UN. Um, but, but uh, I think it was known as a state, right? But it's through, through paperwork and, and through, and now through, they're trying to sit, they're trying to buy it, right? So that they can then, that they can take those people that have nothing, give them something for a moment so that they can then address their immediate needs. But then what are they going to do beyond that? They're stuck in what they call an open air prison. So how are they going to support themselves? Right. So they're, they're trying to buy this land and sell it off. And so that's, that's what I kind of think of, of UBI and, and of the allotment. I mean, the same thing happened in Alaska where they, they divvied up all the Alaskan indigenous land and they made, basically made them start an oil company. <laughs> It's, it's very interesting stuff. Um, NDP prime minister, uh, I mean, I don't think Jagmeet Singh is going to look for a, a modern industrial act, maybe, maybe some sort of new deal, but there's, there's been new green new deal stuff thrown around from a lot of the NDP. And I don't, I, I haven't heard a lot about it. So I don't, I don't know what it proposes, what, if it's thinking anything radical, but I don't think the, the, the status quo NDP uh, party at the moment is going to really give us anything to address the, the crisis and to, to actually invest in, in productive forces. I mean, a lot of this sort of uh, leftist talk in, in the NDP sometimes is about scaling back a lot of things, right? And and making them more sustainable and for sustainability, but uh, to, to meet the needs of Canadians, we need, we need, we definitely need productive forces. Um, the worker right. self-defense, maybe someone else can talk about that. All right. All right. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you guys continue. Okay. Thanks, Corey. Okay, uh, Rosemary. Unmute. Unmute yourself. Hi, Rosemary. Can you unmute? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And see you too. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I, um, I, I would echo a lot of almost everything that Corey's saying on it, but it's, it's, it's kind of a conundrum because we are not in a position, I think we and, and the, the, the progressives to actually change that much uh, at the present. Uh, I'm thinking of the second condition that Trotsky, uh, that I referenced earlier, what Trotsky referred to in terms of what, what is needed to to actually change for, for a new society to come to being, the second condition being that there must be a new progressive class which is sufficiently numerous and economically influential to be able to impose its will upon society. So um, the, the, the working class is shrinking in terms of the the, the, the the people that are actually making things, the people that make things ha make things happen, that that produce things that that used to be where the power lie, and now that possibility is shrinking because of mechanization. So, I really don't know. 
I really don't know. I don't. I don't have an answer to to uh, preventing poverty. Yeah, to be uh, to be explored. We'll see what happens. I I, I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> and a comment. Okay. Thank you, Rosemary. So we're going to move on now to Yasin. Yes, let me go back to Barry's question. Uh, I don't have much time to answer his question. He said to avoid boom and bust cycles, why is it not possible to plan the market economy to st stabilize it? Uh, let me uh, begin with this uh, myth of market economy. So if you ask to the neoclassical economists, uh, and they, they, those are the people who write the uh, uh, textbooks of economists, they will see markets everywhere. They will see markets are very natural. Uh, they, the markets have always dominated the uh, uh, economic world, social societies, they would say. But that's not true, is it? Yes, barter, exchange uh, are very ancient forms of ec uh, economic activity. But uh, the domination of markets are very, very, very new. And, uh, you know, I was watching this uh, great TV show after a very famous Canadian novel, Anne of Green, Green Gables. Uh, there was a fire and um, they had to, uh, and all the community came together and rebuilt the house. You know, the market was not involved there. You know, the, the, the people, the, the, the person that who lost the house didn't go to the market and purchase a new one. The community came together and rebuilt it. In fact, you know, in many, for centuries, this has been the collective uh, production and um, helping each other, solidarity, those communal forms of, Economic activity was the norm, wasn't an exception. So, uh, the, um, you know, domination of market economy will end eventually, sooner or later. But what I'm trying to say is, like, don't believe to the people who say markets have always been there and have always dominated the world. Uh, can market economies be planned? Let me try to, you know, you know, adjust the question a little. Uh, can we plan the capitalist economy? And currently, market economies dominate the capitalist world. Um, look, you know, let's compare. Maybe a silly example, but the uh, look at your households. How do you, uh, uh, you know, how does the economy in your households work? In our household, you know, money comes and it is being spent uh, or according to the needs of the household members. So the needs of the household members uh, is the uh, uh, generator. Is is the uh, uh, the engine of economic activity in our in our in our household, uh, but in, not in the capitalist world, is it? Profit making is so the production is not done to to uh, uh, satisfy the needs of the people. Uh, people are in the uh, the capitalists are in the business to make profit. Um, I, I I love this anecdote uh, and uh, the uh, CEO of the General Electric one of one of the CEOs once said, you know, General Electric is not in the business uh, to, to make appliances, uh, washing machines, uh, dishwashers. It is in the business to make profit. Uh, you know, the uh, dishwasher and your dish, dishes being washed or uh, your, uh, your uh, clothes being, being uh, uh, clean, cleaned. Or, in other words, your needs being satisfied are almost like accidental in, in capitalism. Uh, the firms enter to the market to make profit. Hence, it's chaotic in that sense. And uh, they pull profit when they're uh, trying to make profit, uh, they compete with the other capitalists. So um, uh, there's a kind of a war between capitalists to uh, exploit the workers more to uh, exploit the nature more and uh, that's almost like in the dna of capitalism and there's a fundamental uh, contradiction in capitalism because the uh, only uh, buff is being produced in the uh, by the by the workers and uh, and there's a constant war for capitalists to steal what the workers pr produce so we're talking about a system that is marked with a very uh, violent uh, competition and anarchy and war. Uh, it is a beast that is impossible to be tamed, leashed. And uh, and uh, I think uh, controlling capitalism, uh, planning it to to satisfy the needs of the people, 
uh, to uh, and, and, the, and the and the and the universe and, the, uh, and protect the nature environment is fundamentally impossible. Basic income uh, it includes uh, universal basic income. Uh, it includes three words that I love: universal, basic, and income. I love them all. Uh, but what exactly the, are we talking about here? Uh, I think this is this is. We should, as socialists or as critical people, when somebody is talking about universal basic income, we should stop and wait. What exactly are you talking about? Should be the question that we should ask. Because this, this idea was brought up by um, the neo neoliberal economists too. But in their uh, account, they always thought this as a kind of alternative to welfare state, uh, to uh, free universal health, to free universal education, decent pension, basic income, so on. 30 so seconds. Forth. And they always thought this as a kind of, you know, opportunity to push the wages down. If they're talking about that, when they say universal basic income, I'm against it. And the second big question is how will uh, universal basic income be financed? Uh, is, will it be financed by taxing the rich or will it be financed by uh, uh, increased taxation uh, of, of the working classes? So um, uh, I will end it here. Elizabeth, do we have another round? And no, we don't, but uh, if you give me a second, I'll give you a little more time. Okay, so but thanks, uh, thanks, Yazin. So because we have a little bit of time left, I'm gonna go back and give each person three minutes, three strict minutes to, if they wish, to uh, to wrap up, to say anything uh, they, they, they wish on the topic or any of the questions. So we'll start with Rosemary, Corey, and then Yasin. Rosemary? Okay. So I, I just back to basic income. I think it's I think it's coming. I think it's coming because both sides of the equation want it. The, um, the working class uh, wants the version that's the good version that Yasin was talking about, and the ruling class wants the bad version. So they're going to the, the, the needs will coalesce, and then there'll be a fight to see which version predominates. Uh, it's I, I see it as a as a, a probably something that will lengthen the life span of capitalism, uh, and there will be struggle around it. So, uh, and in the meantime, it will likely also alleviate a lot of suffering amongst the, the poorest uh, poorest element poorest uh, layers of the of the 99.9 percent um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just leave it at that because I think that's that's a discussion that's going to be ongoing and I don't have anything more to, to flesh it out with at the present time so okay thank you Rosemary thank you. Corey uh, yeah, I, just one thing about that, though, is, is, is like I brought up before, is migrant workers are a huge part of our, our economy, especially like our, our well, now I wouldn't call it, say unskilled, but our, 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 our general labor sort of um, industry and, and service industry and whatnot. And I think those people, I, I don't think they're all going to be getting UBI. I think that I think they like like what we've seen in, in the States more so, but here in Canada as well, um, or any any population with uh, with any sort of um, Western population, or even, even in the Emirates and stuff in Saudi Arabia, any privileged society sort of will take advantage of people and they won't be, they'll, they, because of their, where they come from or whatever, because they're not, you know, they're not patriated, they're going to be treated differently and exploited. And I think that's something to really consider because I think those, those people here, you know, in this country or, or in any country, you know, we'll be looking to get out of it. And right now, the only thing they hear is that they just have to keep working hard and, and keep their head down and then they can enjoy the same life, that the, the same privilege that we we do. And they'll, they'll exploit the next generation of migrants or whatever, right? Or, or sorry, they won't. Well, they might, I don't know. But, but the capitalists will exploit the next generation of migrants to, to fill their role. Um, so that's something to think about, I think, with, with UBI and any sort of um, social protections that, that we fight for, that we, that we have. Um, I just wanted to say that, that a little bit more about the crisis um, and how it hasn't really, you know, hasn't solved a lot of the problems from from the old world, right? Like, like there's still a disparity within, you know, between women and men that do similar jobs, you know, or fields that are predominantly female or men. Like, for instance, in Ontario, there was a, a, a cap put on public service workers, and it, it applies to teachers and nurses, but it doesn't apply to firefighters and police officers. And I mean, that's really interesting because those fields are predominantly men, right? So why why are those fields, which are obviously privileged by, you know, well, especially the police force, privileged by the um the ruling class because they protect them. 
and then protect private property. But 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 why are those sectors not not covered by the same pub? Why is it not? That's that's totally sexist. It's sexist law to begin with. So how how is that allowed to fly in in, in capitalism? And and that's that's pushing you know those industries are upset and women are upset obviously about that kind of stuff. And I, I think that that's th- those those are things we need to build around and to and to really demand that we have fundamental changes to society so this this never goes on again. That we don't put one sex above another, or whatever, or one group of people, or, or people that are are from a certain region. You know, like ang- Anglo dominance of the financial industry was within Canada, for instance. Anyways, it's, it's just things I'm thinking about in this this brutal crisis that is capitalism. Uh, thanks for having me on the talk. <laughs> okay, thank you, Corey. Okay, Yasin. Sure, I will try to answer Barry and Chad's questions in, uh, in my wrap up. Uh, here are the problems. Uh, First of all, my beard, beard trimmer is broken. I returned it, and I have to find an alternative solution to that. And uh, another problem is this capitalism keeps uh, going into the crises. Um, and that's a huge problem because it's a broken system. And uh, secondly, uh, always, almost always, uh, capital, the capitalist crises are used as um, opportunities for, for the bosses to pursue their agenda uh, because nowadays the balance of power in the society favors capitalists so the powerful will uh, seize the opportunity and crisis are giving such opportunities to the to, to the to the, to the bosses um, so we have to first of all uh, try to uh, restore this balance of power we should make the uh, people who are uh, hit by the crisis, the recurring capital crisis, that is the working class, the working populations, we should make them powerful so that they can uh, fix this broken system or get rid of this broken system. And um, how uh, is NDP the solution to this this, uh, question? Can NDP uh, pave the way towards a society where working classes are stronger, uh, a society that that is able to overthrow capitalism. Yes and no. I think NDP is the only mass uh, political party in Canada that has the working class representation. It's still, despite despite the changes in its structure, it's still a working class party. When you attempt to to, to NDP conventions, you would see Labour having their seats and having a strong voice there. Uh, but it is very, very bureaucratic. Uh, the uh, the party democracy is broken in NDP, so it is very hard to push the uh, push a workers' agenda in the in the party. But we must, uh, we, if we want a stronger society where the working classes are able to uh, overthrow capitalism, NDP can very, be very instrumental to uh, organize uh, the working classes towards a workers' agenda. And um, I think uh, a crisis uh, 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 provide a kind of awakening uh, among the people too. They look around and try to find answers because they, uh, the questions that they have are about, well, as Rosemary said, barbarism or socialism. They see, uh, you know, their lives are being ruined. They see their friends' uh, lives are being ruined. They see that the uh, social crisis is looming and uh, environmental uh, uh, problems are uh, not being able to address under capitalism people ask questions and so um, it is a high time for us to tell our friends to to tell everyone about how this capitalism is broken and what we should do about it i really enjoyed our discussion today uh, just a reminder don't forget to like this YouTube video and subscribe to uh, Socialist Action YouTube channel uh, so that you can be uh, notified the next time we upload a video there. Again, socialistaction.ca is a wonderful website full of articles, uh, many resources on Marxist theory and economics. Uh, check it out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, a special thanks to Yazin, Rosemary, and Corey, and of course to our producer, Kurt in Mississauga and everyone who participated in our online audience tonight. So please consider buying a subscription to Socialist Action. It's only $25 for one year and it will be delivered to your door by one section of the frontline workers. 
which is our postal workers. So to fill out the form, just go to the website, www.socialaction.ca. And if you would like to join us or to talk to us about joining SA, write to socialistactioncanada at gmail.com or just give us a call at 647-986-1917. That's 647-986-1917. And as Yasin said earlier, please, if you like the show, just click on like and more importantly, subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. Now, our next webcast is on Thursday, that's next Thursday, September the 24th at 7 p.m. And it is titled, The NDP, A Bourgeois Workers' Party. With Gary Porter, SA leader in British Columbia, and Yvonne Hansen and Stephen Crozier, SA members and formal federal NDP candidates in BC. So for more details on that, just visit www.socialsaction.ca. In the meantime, in between time, please stay safe, stay healthy, and be active.